Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Having an effective accounts receivable program in place protects not only cash flow, but it enables you to navigate through challenging billing situations. So in this webinar, uh, we're talking about accounts receivable, and we're really fortunate to have uh, accounts receivable expert, Brittany Hensley, who will speak to all types of questions, uh, including, you know, what are some of the most common mistakes that businesses make when they're trying to create an accounts receivable program or when they're dealing with those issues? You know, how do you know when to or when not to take maybe a more aggressive approach to collect on outstanding accounts? What are some of the best practices to build successful proactive uh, accounts receivable payments, you know, processes in place? And ultimately, I think what we all want to know is what are the building blocks to build a sustainable accounts receivable program? Well, that's what we're going to cover today. And we're fortunate to have a fantastic panelist today with, uh, with Brittany Hensley, who's the CEO of AR Restoration today. Um, before we get going today, I want to thank uh, many of our, uh, of our partners. And uh, our partners are, are several today. We have uh, business mentors. We have the restoration lawyer. In addition to that, uh, we also have uh, AR Restoration, who have all partnered with us today. So, uh, Brittany, uh, why don't you take a moment and can you tell us kind of uh, a little bit about yourself and where you're located in the world? Sure. So, my name is Brittany, as he shared. Um, I'm in Indiana, and um, I am a mom, first and foremost, and my husband is a general manager of a restoration company here in Indianapolis. And so about five years ago, um, you know, his own company was at a point where they were struggling with their AR, needed an option. Um, they were all overworked. All their employees seemed taxed. Um, and nobody was really able to prioritize and focus on it. And so I actually started doing their AR management out, outsourced and still able to stay home with my kids and homeschool them. Um, and I just learned a lot during those couple of years that I um, worked remotely just with them. And then from there, we saw this as um, a need across the country and other companies. And, um, and so through relationships with restoration companies that my husband knew, um, I was able to come in as a personal outsourced account manager um, and work directly with their companies. And then that basically just grew into what now is AR Restoration. And we have um, trained account managers that work with several restoration companies across the country. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that component of the business that, to use your words, it's often kind of ignored or skipped or you know, it's kind of that administrative task that everyone knows is critical, but they never get around to doing. You saw that in the industry and, uh, and you, uh, you saw an opportunity to build a service to really take, uh, take on one of those big critical pain points that so many companies deal with. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, you know, let me introduce myself for those that uh, may be a first time tuning into one of these webinars. My name is Leighton Healy from Know How. We're a digital central hub for technical and operational knowledge in the restoration companies, which includes step-by-step -step processes and workflows for effective accounts receivable programs. You know, I have to stop and say I missed one of our important partners. Uh, Business Development Associates are also one of our promotional partners today. So, Brittany, I want to kick things off with, uh, with a question, and certainly we're going to be getting some questions from the audience, um, but I want to kick things off with a question that I think is, is on everybody's mind is, why, why does accounts receivable become a problem? What, what, are, what are, at the end of the day, the root issues that create these AR nightmares? Yeah. Great question. Um, and, you know, you're probably going to hear me say some of the same things over and over again, because the building blocks really are just, you know, three or four main, main things. Um, but what I said in my intro, it's really about prioritizing. Um, you know, one of the things our company really loves to do is to come in to a smaller restoration company that's just starting to help them really build um, good business practices in their AR from the beginning. Because um, what we find is we're prioritizing um, managing our jobs well, making sure they're run really well, and then we get to the end and we expect payment. And so how do we prioritize AR through the entire job? And so some of those root issues of um, some of these problems are, you know, they come down to documentation, mm -hmm. lack of information, 
um, using good, effective management systems? Um, what is our process as a company? Do our employees follow our SOPs? Um, and, you know, there we are an emergency response business. So restoration companies are going out really quick and they're responding to emergency situations. Well, we tend to start funding jobs um, before getting approval. And we come to the back end and if we if those get denied, it will only pay partially by the insurance company or the adjuster. We're mm -hmm. self-funding jobs and it's decreasing our cash flow. And so it's slowing down in the beginning of the process and setting expectations with the customers, um, getting our process in play, and from the very beginning, prioritizing RAR. Yeah. And, you know, uh, just to highlight, there's, a, you know, so, there's so many nuggets we could drill in there, but prioritizing our AR. You know, it's, it's um, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I heard years ago is that humans, uh, you know, are the, the only thing that walks the earth that procrastinates. You know, the only thing that puts critical things off that is fully aware that by not doing this, it's going to hurt me later. And uh, it's a unique, it's a unique distinguishing quality of humans. And, uh, and so it's interesting how I just love that description and, and, you know, and we're all familiar with it, but, you know, you're responding to a critical situation and you're, you're, you're rolling out cash uh, essentially because the job has to be taken care of. But at the end of the day, you, you, you know, there's this expectation that you're going to get paid for it. And when that payment doesn't come, um, obviously you, you can really be in a, in a pickle where a person can have their, their property or their, or their business or their home restored. And you can be in a situation where you're stuck holding the bill. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm wonder, um, and I'm sure we could just like spend the whole time talking about crazy stories of situations that, that you've been brought into. But uh, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about, you know, just overall, when I think about root, root problems, and I think about the issues where, you know, if we were to look at these AR issues that are kind of in a business, and we were to follow, you know, the root systems back to where they started, I really think that there are internal and there are external, meaning there are things coming from inside the business, Mm -hmm. But there's also things that honestly the business can't control and it's coming from outside the business. Sure. So could we, what, could we talk maybe internally for a moment? Like when I think about internally, if we followed back those roots to the actual root problem, um, what would you kind of identify as like the, 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 the roots of, of AR problems in a business? Okay. Um, well, it goes back to a little bit of what I said. Um, mm -hmm. And internally, again, that's, are we funding projects um, without the approval? Um, are we using good documentation and green agreement signed up front in, in that expectation of what's going to happen and who's responsible for payment? Um, but right, are we possibly doing work without getting it approved um, and supplements not getting approved and they're getting denied, um, but self-funding or doing the work without that approval, we need to work on possibly in our state looking at you know, what, if you're from California, I already know you can't do this, but here in Indiana, um, you can get the ACV or 50% up front. So how, what can you collect up front before you start the job? You know, you have your documentation, your agreement signed, you know, what can you collect up front before starting? So then at least by the end of the job, if something you don't completely lose, if that makes sense, um, and you break even, if something doesn't go as planned, um, but, you know, a lot of times we're so focused on just getting through and running a job well, what can we start prioritizing up front and proactively addressing? So internally, I would say, um, you know, some of these problems can originate from those things, like that yeah. process of can we get ACV or 50% up front before starting um, and our documentation and agreements are set. Yeah, which... I think right now in, in our kind of calm, you know, we're all sitting in our offices or in our home offices, maybe having a coffee or something like that. It makes sense. It's like, yeah, of course that makes sense. But in an, in an emergency scenario, you know, everything is urgent. Everything is, we've kind of moved to that, like, you know, fight or flight mode. And what seems obvious is, is not always obvious. Right. So I, I really like you made a comment earlier where if you don't have those SOPs in place, and SOPs are really for those times where you need to, you know, just be basically move into kind of like autopilot, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's a good point. So what about on the external side? I okay. mean, the, the reality is, is that there's there's things that are outside of the business that do, in fact, um, you know, have their roots in AR problems. What are, what are some of those external things if we just kind of name them and throw them out there for the discussion here? Yeah, so I would say not knowing where the money is. And so, you know, adjusters, insurance companies, homeowners, mortgage, mortgage companies, who's sitting on the money? Um, and so those are the external contributors as far as like, just knowing where it's at, um, mm -hmm. following it and staying in front of that check. And so we, we, if we don't have our documentation nailed down and the mortgage company is waiting on good paperwork mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't know that. So like working with companies and phone calls, um, you know, I could call the mortgage company and say, yeah, I'm, I've been sitting on this check for 30, 60 days. Just, I'm just waiting on somebody to send me the right paperwork. And so I would say external contributors, they really are down to those three people and how we managed the paperwork and the documentation and the communication with all three, how we stayed in front of the check and we know where it is and where it's going next. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how often, Brittany, do you think that um, they're, they're, cause you've, you've, you've been in this industry for a long time. Uh, you've, you've been on the phone with so many overdue clients. Um, how many of them are actually you know, because in our minds, we think they are. How many of them are like actually nasty people that are like committed to not paying a dime? Yeah, it's, it's not probably as high a percentage as we think, but they are, I mean, they are out mm -hmm. there and we do all deal with them. Um, and that communication up front with that homeowner, that client is like, that is so important because you really can figure mm -hmm. that out right away. Um, typically, yeah. for the most part, if they're going to be somebody that um, is just, not planning on paying or is basically committing fraud at this point. Um, you know, one of the key factors that we notice in that psychology of that is, you know, they're probably just going to nitpick everything because they're trying to drag out when they actually are going to have to pay. Um, and so that is usually a good key factor is if somebody is just going after the quality of work and complaining, argue about everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it's, it's like a little red flag, right? And so you can either be, def you can either be defensive or you can say, Hey, this might be an indicator of something more serious that I have to, you know, watch out for. So let, actually, I, I'm glad you brought that point up around customer expectations. That, that's a, you know, that really is um, our next question here is, is what are the expectations that we should be setting with our clients? Um, and how do you recommend that you communicate those expectations? Um, and certainly, you know, I, I, I'm sure those vary slightly between residential and commercial. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's talk about that for a moment with expectations. What, what are those expectations uh, to be set with clients before the work starts? And, and how would you recommend we set them? Sure. Um, I think, it's, again, working with a legal professional to make sure you have good documents and agreements um, created. But mm -hmm. it's, again, saying let's slow down and that, you know, like we want to rush out. We want to act quick. We want to respond, but we need, there needs to be a moment where we do slow down and make sure that we have a conversation with the customer, um, mm -hmm. that we understand their role um, with the insurance and with the restoration company, that they understand how that works um, with their ACV check, their deductible, mm -hmm. et cetera, of what they need to do with that um, and how the entire process is gonna work. So they feel like they're part of the process the entire time. Typically, customers start regressing, and you can see that attitude change when they feel like they don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so, it, with a homeowner specifically, <laughs> that communication is extremely important by the project manager who's in the home um, and who's directly talking them, to them from the very beginning. Um, mm. And then, you know, commercial side is it is different. It, it can be very different depending on the vendor agreement. You know, paying direct their net is different, um, are they working with insurance and how high their deductible is. So again, it's knowing that information and communicating, are you working directly with the company um, mm. and, and so forth. And so that is a different conversation between residential and commercial. Um, but it's again, um, having your project managers ready and prepared with what they need to be documenting and what they need um, to be supplying for those customers. Yeah, that's very that's very well said, and and uh, you know I want to I want to jump on something that you said that I think really merits a, a little bit more discussion. Um, you talked about like the psychology of of these clients, and and that's such an that's such an interesting aspect. I remember in a in a previous life, 
um, you know, I was, uh, we were growing and expanding this franchise system and we had, you know, locations all over North America. And uh, when we ran into those um, AR situations and I, I got involved more often than not, see if I can paint this accurately. It's that you'd have these scenarios where, you know, what happened to the home is kind of like the bad guy. And then the, you know, the restoration company comes in and, and you're the good guy. But when communication's bad, you join the dark side. You know what I mean? And so now you're also, the, you know, the, my house got hurt, got wrecked. That's the problem. You've been, you know, you haven't communicated well. You're the problem. And so I'm the, I'm kind of like the, the homeowner on the good side and you're on the bad side. Um, does, does that, you know, does, does that happen? Yeah, it- it is very true. So, Mm -hmm. you know, typically when we have come in, you know, it's already after the job is done and, Mm -hmm. you know, we start to work with the customers and, you know, we, we work on behalf of the restoration company. Okay. And so when we call, Mm -hmm. they were calling on behalf of, well, you can kind of tell within the first 30 seconds that that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, You know, we have our documentation to know exactly what's been happening in the job and the relationship with the customer. But, I have found sometimes they just want somebody to be empathetic and to listen and to hear them. Um, And so we have trained our people that, you know, let's remember that their house may have just burned down or their basement may be flooded. They may be out of their home. And I know restoration companies are so, so good at not, not noticing, you know, they notice that and they have a relationship with the homeowner. So we need to continue that relationship and partnership. And so, you know, for example, I, I went back and forth with a client, with the insurance company, with the client, with myself, ex- trying to explain what the situation was. And it really boiled down to, she just wanted to be mad mm-hmm. and she just wanted to be heard. And yeah. once we could get through that and then I could get, and we could, okay, I've heard your emotional side. Now here's the facts. We got, yeah. we could get somewhere. Um, and so that it really is a piece of it. Um, yeah. it remembering their people going through hard times and I know that the heart of a restoration company is about helping. And yeah. so getting caught up in the process um, yeah. and that communication is so key. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really well said. And uh, it's a tough balance because, you know, when you're, it's hard work to bring a house or a property um, from, you know, catastrophe to, you know, back to back to a place of calm and, and, and completely restored. And, you know, mm-hmm. it takes, it takes, a type of worker that's willing to kind of roll up their sleeves and, and maybe sometimes deal with, uh, you know, difficult and even dangerous uh, work environments. And so to have that person also attuned to be, you know, I guess, in, in the, I guess we, we call it soft skills, right? To also be able to listen, to realize that there should be time taken for um, empathy and whatnot. Um, do you have any, do you have any advice for maybe um, people whose workforce are, let's call them, they're maybe more technical, maybe they're more kind of like, um, get the job done rather than, you know, I should, I should take time to listen to this client. And, you know, they did lose their home. Do you have any advice for how we should, you know, influence maybe some of our kind of, you know, hands-on, maybe slightly blue collar workers? I, you know, I think it's making it, I think it's building it and bridging it into the culture of your company you know, what we're here to do. Um, and so, you know, not putting the process over anything else. We want a job very well done. We want the process done, but we are a relational company. Um, and again, like I always stress, this is a referral base. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to remember that this, this client not only is, you know, in a situation right now where we're helping them, but they're also, their voice can be very loud, um, on the negative or on the positive. And so in all situations, you know, it needs to be built into our culture and our vision and our mission of how we treat our customers. Um, and that needs to be important. That customer, you know, there's that conversation of the customer's always right. Well, the business can't always lose either. Um, and so that balance of hearing and listening and working out those um, issues. And there are times where you just have to be, well, this is what the company needs to do. Um, and, you know, you have to know, and knowing the facts and working through those things. But mm-hmm. yes, to your point, I believe that it needs to be, you know, driven into your culture about how we have customer, um, how we treat our customers. Mm-hmm. 
So really, let me ask you then that I think that that really leads into an, another good question, which is um, like when you're trying to when your business is at a size where you may actually be able to have someone on your team responsible for accounts receivable, maybe it maybe it falls on the plate to someone in an administrative role or in a sales role. Mm-hmm. Um, for many of us, we think of that work as kind of tedious and sometimes you're you're going into a fight and so you need someone who can be aggressive and hold the line. Um, but what you're also describing is that this person has to be able to be empathetic and listen and maybe give opportunity to, to, to vent. Um, what would you say, like, what are the, what's the personality of someone who's good at doing AR collections? So, you know, what we, what our mission is and in, in the vision of our company is that we can come in and we can work beside and partner with restoration companies and their customers. Um, and we train our, our account manager that, you know, their customers, that's their referral business. Hmm. And so that's an important thing to remember and how we treat. And so kindness is a big deal. Um, and so when I think about the person I'm looking for to be a good account manager to collect AR, um, they have to be um, not only very organized and be able to put the facts together of the, and follow a process, but they also need to be able to work well with others and communicate well. And so when we are training to make those calls that we know could be to an upset customer, we're saying, remove the emotion, be professional, kill them with kindness, but be factual, stick to the facts. Um, and so, you know, that, that can help. Um, but then last thing is just be a good listener sometimes. Honestly, by the time they get to us um, on this side, typically the restoration company is, is pretty burnt on already hearing all these arguments from a customer. And so, you know, those, those conversations can get very old and very draining and exhausting. And so um, we have to be willing to understand when we need to listen and when we need to say, okay, we got it, but here's the next step. Right. No, that makes, that makes sense. And I, I think that we would all agree that, um, that, you know, uh, being compassionate and having kindness is, is, is an important aspect. Uh, I think you'd also agree that sometimes in some accounts, uh, you have to take an assertive, you know, maybe arguably uh, sometimes aggressive approach to, to getting things resolved. When would you recommend that a person take a more kind of assertive, maybe more serious approach uh, to collecting on account and, and how would you recommend them going about that? Sure. When we, when we call an account where there has been a lack of communication and follow up by, by the customer that is maybe holding the check um, mm-hmm. or owes the company money, we're going to confront them with the, the amount of time that we have tracked that we try to communicate, whether it was mm-hmm. by email, whether it was by you know mail, a demand letter or invoice mail, whether it's by phone calls. We're going to say we really tried to do our job and contacting you and making you aware of, of this payment that is needed and owed to this company for these reasons. Um, and so we are direct in that fact. And so in our process, then we go, we have a process of next steps. So whether it's, you know, the lien date needs to be filed and we explain what that is and how that works and why that is being filed. That might be like the last line of defense for, the company. The next would be talking to an attorney and having demand letters sent from an attorney and looking into small claims court. And so those things, again, per state, you know, your statutes um, and and what you are able to do, Um, but knowing the circumstance. So, you know, our account managers, they need to know the entire story before they pick up that phone and call. um, And they need to understand the circumstances and then they need to be direct. And, and what our process is. And so, you know, I have some people that say, you're not gonna get a dime. And I have to say, I understand what you're saying. So, and that's your right, but our right is this next step. Yeah. Because this company did work and they deserve to be paid for it. Yeah. And then you just leave them with, that's in your court, but we, we, we have to respond. Yeah. No, I think that I think you've laid that out really well, and and uh, I I think it's really um, important how much you lean on that process. Saying, you know, I appreciate that that's your perspective, but we have a process here, and 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 this is you know this is the next step, and uh, you know it it uh, it keeps things on the rails so to speak, you know, yeah. um, 
So, you know, I, and this, this might put you on the spot a little bit, but, but would you be comfortable giving us a, maybe an example of what a serious conversation with a client might, might sound like? Um, you know, perhaps if we were kind of role play for a moment, if, you know, that, that client that just would never pick up the phone, picks up the phone, uh, uh, what do you say? Sure. sure. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, who I am, who I'm calling on behalf of, um, it's so good to talk to you today. I've been trying to contact you. Did you receive the demand letter on this date, this date? Um, we have an unpaid account and we really need to work hard to get this paid as soon as possible so that we don't have to move forward in any of our legal processes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would remain factual. I can even state, I've talked to your, your insurance adjuster. They have told me that the check was mailed on this date to this address. Did you receive that? And what did you do with it? And this is what needs to happen next. So we need to receive payment by this date or else our next step in our process is, is to do this. We'll file a lien on your on this property and this is what that means. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be following up to make sure payment is received on that date. Mm -hmm. So and then I will let them know that I will call back by a certain date if it's not complete. So they know that they're gonna hear from me again. Yeah, that's excellent. And, and, and it really goes to highlight, Brittany, how much emphasis you put on facts. Like mm -hmm. you say, you know, you know, you know, this is who I am. This is why I'm calling. You know, this was done on this date. Did you receive it? This was done on this date. I've spoken to this individual. This is their name. You know who they are. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it's, it's bringing like facts into that conversation that I think, at least for me listening in, it just brings a lot of weight to that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's amazing yeah. how many will deflect to their insurance adjuster. And mm. so when you can say, I've actually spoken to them, yeah, this is the information they gave me, then no more playing the game and hmm. no more loops to jump through. Like this is, this is what it is. Yeah. No, and that's, I, I, I think that's a great opportunity, you know, for us to maybe look at the difference because what you just described, I mean, it's clear that you've, you know, this is not your first rodeo. You've done that a lot. And so that's a very, you know, finely tuned approach. Um, and to do it right on the spot, I mean, that, that indicates, you know, you, you're you very experienced in this. Um, this is a good time to ask, what are the pros and cons? Like, what are the pros and cons of maybe doing your, handling your AR internally versus using uh, an AR support uh, service like like your own? Could, could you maybe you know, break those yeah. down a bit for us? Yeah, um, you know, pro internally, um, no one knows the job better than the ones who did it. Mm -hmm. And so that relationship with the customer and continuing that relationship um, stay straight through, um, maintaining that sh is, is a pro. Um, the con of internally for what we would say is there is the emotion behind it, like we've been talking about. And so, um, the, that AR is packed onto a lot of other parts of the job. Mm -hmm. um, and so typically it's just becomes another task too internally. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be taxing. It can be the last thing. So on companies we work with, either the owner himself is doing it. And that's a lot on the owner's plate mm -hmm. or the owner has passed it on to somebody in the office and it's the last thing on their plate. And, think, and so, you know, the last thing they want to do at the, is make calls to collect and have all those conversations that can be very draining and exhausting um, and that we just don't want to make. And so yeah. we, you know, what my husband would say, he quotes a lot, is we like the sniper approach versus the shotgun approach. <laughs> and yeah. so the sniper approach is there is somebody solely focused on it. Yeah. And so whether you can carve that out internally um, and make sure that there is one person who is focusing solely on your AR management or you outsource that, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's what we believe, you know, in our approach is that we are focused in collecting and managing AR um, mm -hmm. because that person who is focused on that, they can provide you with the data. Um, and when you need it, it's at their fingertips. They can tell you how much is in your AR, how much is sitting, you know, in the 30 to 60 and the 90 and the 120 plus and how long, yeah. you know, how long it's been there. But also they can tell you circumstantially like what's happening in each job. Yeah. And so like in our company, the, where we've kind of like woven across lines in a difference be, between a collections company and an AR management company, which is what we are, um, mm -hmm. we can partner and we can kind of 
fill in the gaps of a restoration yeah. company um, and really just work directly with them in a relationship. And so that's where we've kind of blended <laughs> um, what we do. First is the collections company, which would be like a next step if you can't, yeah. if your yeah. AR management comes to a halt, if you get to your last line of defense in the office. So um, those are what I would say would be the pros and cons is, you know, yeah. internally, that's great because again, like nobody knows the job better than you guys do in the customers. Yeah. No, that's really helpful. And I think that uh, that's a great summary of it. You know, one of the things that, um, that we talked about uh, just briefly was around things matter state to state. You know, sometimes there's different jurisdictions. And, uh, and Andrew asked a great question, which is about collecting AR across state lines. So if you're in one state and you complete work in another state, sometimes clients will say, well, you're, you're in a different jurisdiction. And so honestly, uh, there's no recourse for me not paying my bill. Um, what would be your advice for uh, a restorer who needs to collect on account for a project that they completed out of state? Out of state. So, you know, for us, we work with multiple states. Um, mm -hmm. And so we work within that state's jurisdiction, if you would, and we follow their rules. And so for California, we cannot collect anything up front. Um, and so we follow their statutes. Um, and so if you're working with a collection company, they obviously need to be licensed for that state. Hmm. That makes sense. So there is a difference. So like if they're not licensed to be collecting um, as an outsourced AR management, we don't have to do that because um, we hmm. work under contract with the company. And so that, right. makes, that you know makes it different for us. So for you guys collecting across out, out of state, you do have to follow whatever that state's um, guidelines are as far as their late fee percentages, everything is, is different. Hmm. Hopefully that helps. Answer yeah. some of We've had to work with attorneys in each state at times to make sure we know legally what we can do and what we cannot do. Yeah. So like we're in California, we have several California clients and it is very different than Indiana or Florida or Pennsylvania that mm -hmm. we all work with. And so we have an attorney that we can ask those questions and figure out where we are legally bound. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, and, and correct me if I'm, if I, if I mis misinterpret anything, but let's say, you know, I'm in uh, Washington and I respond to a project in Oregon and, uh, and the, and the job's done and the client is uh, content with the work. And then I go to collect and they say, Nope. And you say, you know what? Um, that's not how we do things in Oregon, you know? Or, or whatever the response is, um, you know, what I'm hearing is it sounds like proactively, uh, we really should go into that job knowing, okay, so, you know, what are the, the regulations of that state around, um, you know, collections and, and, you know, but assuming that we responded to it because, hey, let's be honest, it's a tough time in the market right now. We needed the work, I wanted to keep my guys going. And so I'm in a situation now where, you know, I didn't know those things. Uh, maybe one more time. And, and again, I don't mean to, as they say, maybe beat a dead horse, but one more time. Uh, I'm in that situation. I didn't do those proactive things. Jobs in Oregon. I'm in Washington. Mm -hmm. Just walk me through it. What, what am I supposed to do? So I, you know, I would continue to keep communication and consistent communication with whoever the customer is um, mm -hmm. and the debt about the debt owed but I would work with an attorney in that state or I would communicate with another restoration company that maybe you have a relationship with and figure out what the statutes are and what you are mm -hmm. legally able to do. So mm -hmm. every state has different late fee structures um, mm -hmm. and, and demand letter protocols as far as dates after contact. So mm -hmm. you, you can't contact after a certain amount of days in certain mm -hmm. states. And so you just figure out those processes, whether it's with another you know, company in that, you know, that you have a relationship with or an mm. attorney, I would, I would get that information and then follow yeah. that process. And then follow that process. Yeah, yeah. Great. Great. Which, you know, I, and again, I mean, I think this is a great time to plug organizations like uh, the RIA because yes. sometimes it's through yes. those organizations that you can actually be connected to restorers in other States to be able to reach out in kind of a friendly environment and say, hey, uh, we're both members of the RIA. You're in Oregon. I'm in Washington. 
I, I'm in a situation. I, I need some processes here. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's great. I was thinking about the RA would be a great support. Yeah. Fantastic. So, you know, I, I got a funny story, but I'm going somewhere with it. I was in Wisconsin once and uh, sorry, Wyoming, I was in Wyoming and I, I drove into this little town and there was this wonderful store that I went into and it was called the fireworks superstore. Right. And it was amazing. And, uh, you know, you start on the one aisle and there's, you know, little, little tiny things that go crackle and whatnot. But as you get to the back of the store, there's like the big, like, I think they had names like Mount Vesuvius and stuff like that. Right. Um, and similarly, restorers oftentimes want to know, like, what are the big, the big hammers, so to speak, like in the armory of me collecting money, what mm -hmm. are kind of the, you know, the big, what's kind of the, the big stick, if you know what I mean? Like, you know, what really do I have available to me if I do have to take things quite seriously? So are you like building blocks? Is that kind of what you're saying? Like to my AR management or like, what are the big? I think, sorry, just to clarify is that, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes, sometimes on the contractor side, um, you know, the homeowner will say, well, I'm not paying or the, or the business owner will say that. And I'm not always aware, like, so what, like what, what actual tools do I have? You know, what kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, what kind of pointy sticks do I have that I can enter this fight with? Now you had mentioned about liens and things like that. But um, if you were to go all the way to like, you know, what is kind of the most serious or let's call it most powerful tool um, in a restorer's armory, let's call it. Sure. Um, yeah, I would, so, you know, I've always kind of, late fee structures aren't something that's super effective. Hmm. If somebody's not going to pay, that's really not going to be the most effective thing to get them to pay. Um, and so, you know, demand letters get sent and that sort of thing, but the filing a lien, that is really for me the, the okay, let's see what they do with this. Hmm. Um, that to me, that is really the last defense that we have to see if they will flip and decide, okay, they're serious. Cause hmm. outside of that, you're looking, you're weighing your options on small claims court and, a, and an attorney fee. And you have to right. look at, is it worth it? Is yeah. the fight worth it? And so sometimes we can kind of get stuck in the fight because we want to fight and we did the job and we deserve to be paid. Yeah. Um, and then when you get to that point, you know, then you really have to decide, is it worth it? Yeah. How much are we going to be paying out to get this much back in hours of work and that sort of thing? And so, you know, we go through our process, consistent communication, um, mm -hmm. I would say is really the first line of, of, you know, like the first point you stick is the fact we're not going away. Yeah. So some people just see how long you last, how long you hang. And when you're yeah. still calling and you're still communicating after a certain period of time, usually they, they get worn out. <laughs> um, yeah. But if you're really just trying to commit fraud, coming in with those facts, like we know where the check is, you deposit it in your bank, we talk to your bank, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. We're gonna file a lien and this is what that means. That's really, that's what you got. Like that's your point of stick. And then yeah. small claims court after that, if it's, if it's a job that's worth that. Yeah. And I think, you, you know, you've, you've certainly underscored the fact that you have to weigh, you know, it's a trade-off, right? You have to weigh, am I, am I in this fight for, for principle, you know, or, you know, or is this, you know, what is the business decision here, right? Because is, there's absolutely, you know, you did the work, you know, justify, you have every reason to go and get paid. Um, but on the same side, you know, there must be times, Brittany, and correct me if I'm wrong, where um, you count your losses. Are there, is there a point where you say, you know, this is, this is just kind of where you got to count your losses? Yeah, there are, you know, we mm -hmm. work with companies where, you know, what's been hanging out there for over 90 days is a 250 charge because they came out and looked at the job mm -hmm. and let's write that off, you yeah. know, and so you have to kind of look at what, what are we still spending a lot of our time and our energy on and is yeah. it worth it? And then, yeah, definitely. Correct. Balance. Yeah. So Brittany, let me ask you, I think this is kind of a, a scenario that's, I'm not saying it's unique to this COVID pandemic, but I, I do believe that it's uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's been accelerated a little bit, but you can envision a scenario where a homeowner or a business owner, um, something occurred to their, their residence or their place of business and, and it merited a restoration claim. 
Um, but they've been out of business or out of work for quite a while. And so there hasn't been a lot of money coming in the door. Work gets done, check comes in. There's a lot of holes in their world that have to get filled. And they're here, they're holding this $30,000, $50,000 check. You see where I'm going with this, right? Tempting, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do we get ahead of that? So, you know, I think it's the one we like to, from the very beginning of when an invoice is sent, educate our, you know, customers on what happens with the check when you get it. Um, the expectation and and so I and this might be a different scenario but you, you talk to homeowners they mm -hmm. didn't know that they were just supposed to sign the check and mail it to you have mm -hmm. a mail on it so they put it in the bank you know yeah. um so it's educating them what happened to the check and that this is you know a multiple party check can't just put it in your bank it's got to go mm -hmm. to the restoration company um also giving options you know and so like mm -hmm. in a situation where like that just in a bad stream of luck right there, and they need money. Um, have options with your company, um, talking about payment plans, credit card options, or working with financial companies that can do financing, like Green, like at Green Sky, for example. Um, having those things set up that when you talk to them, you can say, well, we can do a payment plan if it's like a self-pay. You know, if they have a, a check that is due to your restoration company, it just needs to get mailed to your restoration company. But in other situations, you know, you can do a payment plan within your office. That's something you're going to follow up on or your AR, your AR team is going to follow up on, um, mm -hmm. on a monthly basis, making sure they're sending in the payment that you guys describe. So if you're saying, you know, I owe, they owe $10,000. Well, in the next three months, we're going to break that down in monthly payments. And we need this month, each month, each month if that makes sense. Um, sometimes we just offer and say, hey, you know what? I think a credit card payment, if you put this on a credit card and you pay off the credit card, that might be a smarter decision at this point than having a debt with this company. Mm -hmm. um, so you can offer those. You can offer financing if, if that's an option and um, at your company. And so those are, I would say, three options that you guys could consider um, to work with. Mm -hmm. And Brittany, to talk about um, uh, like order of communication, you know, when you think about, um, I mean, one of the things that's, that I'm certainly leaving this conversation with, or I will leave this conversation with, is communication and how critical that is. Um, but thinking about order of communication, when should that first call um, with a client about payment occur? When, when should that first conversation occur? And, and whose role should that conversation be? Like whose responsibility should that conversation be? Sure, so when when our role kicks off is when the invoice is sent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Now again, let me just plug about invoicing. One thing that gets really confusing is backdating invoicing because it does kind of screw up your AR. So we don't mm -hmm. encourage backdating invoicing, but we invoice after the work is done and the COS has been signed. That mm -hmm. triggers us to then call the company and say, Hey, mm -hmm. did you receive your invoice? And if not, it's on the way. Mm. Here's what, and again, it depends on who the invoice is going to. We call who mm -hmm. the invoice was sent to. So if the invoice mm -hmm. is sent to the insurance company, we're going to call them. So we are calling within a week of invoice sent and we are saying to the insurance mm -hmm. company, is there anything else you need? Do you have all the paperwork to cut this check within the next seven days mm -hmm. or sooner? <laughs> Um, and so we stay on top of that process and we know where the check is every day. Yeah. Um, and we don't lose it. So when, if the insurance company is the one that got the invoice and we did that initial call, mm -hmm. you got it, right? Is there anything else they need that we're going to call back and say, or we're going to find out even then what date do you think the check will be cut? And then mm -hmm. we're going to follow up to make sure it did. And then we're going to call mm -hmm. the homeowner and we're going to say, Hey, your check is on the way. Here's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. and there's no gap we've closed yep. the gap and everybody has been communicated to so mm -hmm. we start within the first week of invoice then and communicate mm -hmm. yeah and so that is you know the project's done and then and then and then what you you know very detailed process so i'm thinking um and just to almost complete the picture if i was to go back you know back a few steps um you know in the restorers business um what I'm envisioning based on our discussion today is that as early as 
you know, the, that first person who's kind of boots on the ground on the job site, yeah. um, be that an estimator, be that a project manager, um, be that a technician. It sounds like what you described earlier in our conversation is it should be in the culture of the company yeah. that, that you're educating that client. And so whoever that person is, they should know that if they're the first set of boots on the ground, you know, obviously you want to you know, you want to uh, be empathetic and compassionate to that client. Something terrible just happened to something very valuable for them. Um, but in that conversation to be able to very assertively say, um, and let me take you through what our process is for, for payment once the project is completed. You're yeah. going to receive a, a check from your insurance provider. That check is actually not to be deposited. In you know, you can say, it sounds like at that very, very first boots on the ground, they yeah. need to, to have that conversation. Yeah, we absolutely believe that. And we um, try to encourage companies to teach that it, it's everybody's role mm -hmm. to help in that process of communication through the entire job for AR. So everybody has a hand in the AR process because they've done mm -hmm. their job from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious, Brittany, um, if, if we were to um, be sitting beside one of your, your uh, account reps, uh, someone who's uh, just, you know, their full day is is pursuing AR. Uh, I really want to maybe get your insight into uh, the, the software, the systems, the tools that, that are necessary. Um, so I'm just curious, like what, um, what, what do they have open in front of them? Like what's, what's tracking everything? What are they, what, what are they using? Like what are all the tools um, on their desktop or kind of on their desk uh, for a daily um, you know, um, focused period of AR collection? Sure. So at our company, we work directly in whatever job management system the restoration mm -hmm. company is using. So we yeah. are given access. So we can work directly in Dash, PSA. Mm -hmm. If you're just using Google Drive, we can do that too. Um, mm -hmm. So we work in whatever system they're using. And we also help encourage. So like if they are a newer company and they're still in Google Drive and QuickBooks, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have companies that are using email systems, you know, and just tagging the, the customer's name in the email, and then you follow the email trail. Mm. So then we're, we're teaching them, you know, at that point, let's move to a Google Drive so that we can have a client and all their information, and all the notes in the same spot. Um, mm -hmm. And so we can work in whatever job management system, but that documentation and those job notes are so important to have organized because that is what you use when you're calling um in your ar job and so you know our team we have our own mm -hmm. spreadsheet that we create for each team member so every account mm -hmm. manager is going to have um their company's mm -hmm. um, information but out in every job mm -hmm. and the job numbers and the information that they need um mm -hmm. they will log into that company's job management system and mm -hmm. have access to them all the job notes all the documents so that that way, when we pick up the phone, we have all the information we need. We're talking to an insurance adjuster and they say, well, I never got the COS. No problem, I'll send it to you right now. I never received the invoice. No problem, I'll send it to you right now. And we can email those documents quickly. And so there's no more gap. There isn't a hanging up the phone and then calling back in a couple days after we talk to somebody else to get that information. You know, So it's, it's minimizing that gap. Um, for companies having as much information as we can in front of us. Interesting. Yeah, I know it sounds like, um, you know, you're, uh, and, and if I was to just, you know, think of myself in the, in the shoes of one of our participants, it sounds like, you know, you're, you're definitely leveraging, you know, whatever software you're using, like could be Dash, could, could be, uh, even could be a Google Drive document. And, mm -hmm. um, and the way that your company works, which is, I think, it makes perfect sense is that you'll just essentially just partner in whatever system you're using. Yeah. Um, but, but it sounds like, you know, being able to have all of that information clearly in front of you. I mean, everything that you just described um, <laughs> doesn't sound like me um, pulling over on the side of the road and flipping to that part of my agenda where I scribbled down their phone numbers and saying, all right, I'll just make some AR calls, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, it's me again. <laughs> Call me back. Remember me? Rebuilt your home? You know? Um, what you just described does not sound like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that I think that that's one of the things that you said earlier. It's like either, you know, uh, either either your team, Brittany, or someone in the company has to just take 
um, a focused approach. And it sounds like one of the one of the things not to take away from the, the skill and the talent and the processes that you've developed, but it sounds like one of the things that is just a key to success that in this case your team brings is just be it that focused person, that focused role, that focused time, where it's like this is just AR. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm curious. There one of the things that we haven't ch- chatted much about, and, and you know we, we're we're coming up on time here, but we haven't chatted too much about the angle of the of the claims adjuster of the insurance side. Um, what advice What advice can you offer us um, for just working effectively with the insurance stakeholder in in AR situations? Sure. Um, you know, one thing my husband would say as he is in restoration mm-hmm. as general manager is he says. Mm-hmm. You know, he will say the project manager in our company, we are the experts on restoration. The adjuster is the expert on claims. And so it's coming together and understanding, you know, the adjuster, because they can be a bear to work with sometimes, right? And they can really hold up the process if we can't figure out a way to work together. Um, And you know our roles, but to be direct and, and confident and, you know, this is what we are recommending and this is what we expect to get done. And this is what we Mm -hmm. think needs to be done. And we need to get on the same page and make sure that's all approved again up front so that we're not funding things that aren't approved. Right. (laughs) And supplementals that are going to come back to bite us. Um, And so, you know, working along with them through the entire process and clear communication and making sure each, each role has been, um, has done their job well and done what they're expected to do. So that way, when we get into the AR process, um, you know, when we talk to insurance adjusters and things like that, we have the information we need because hmm. it's been put in by the project manager and the system of all those job notes and all those yeah. conversations that were had and what was approved. So that when there are questions that come up from a desk adjuster even, or the adjuster, we can go back and we say, well, actually on this date, we had this conversation and this is what we decided. Yeah. Um, so working alongside them in both our specific roles, um, mm-hmm. with respect, but also in direct confidence of what needs to be done as a company, mm-hmm. um, that goes a long way, I guess, in helping guys mm-hmm. be successful in the end. Yeah, no, I think, you know, and, and, and that's great. And, and what I hear, uh, as a kind of a theme over all of this, Brittany, is that when you're on the receiving end, meaning you're the client or you're the, the claims adjuster and you're on the receiving end of, 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 a, of either someone like yourself or someone who's part of a restoration company and you can hear how organized they are. You can hear that like they have a system. They say, okay, well, um, you know, I wasn't able to reach you today. And so just to let you know, our next step is, you know, they can hear that this is an organized business. They have a process. Uh, mm-hmm. This is clearly something that they're tracking everything that is, that, that's a very strong defense is what I'm hearing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. So uh, I am curious, you know, um, maybe as a closing question, uh, one of the things that uh, we had talked to a little bit ago was uh, kind of the psychology of, of these clients, the, psych- the psychology of people that don't pay. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, you've been, you've been on, you know, I would say probably there's probably hundreds, hundreds of calls that you've been on and you've had to navigate things to a, to a conclusion. Um, when you think about, you know, just spending all that time on the phone with these people, what are some kind of closing points? You'd say, here are just some general best practices. Here are some, you know, this is kind of the, the, the winning points that I would leave you with. Um, yeah, it's like those building blocks and those best practices is, is again, just is having the documentation, the information that you need. Um, mm-hmm. There are those people out there that are intentionally just going to try to slip away without paying. Um, mm-hmm. We have had lots of scenarios of change phone numbers and change mailing addresses. Um, get as much information up front as possible, especially with rent- rental properties. Um, when you're mailing demand letters and invoices to a rental property and that the owner doesn't even live there. Yeah. Find the correct documentation information up front in your job management system of who we're contacting and have multiple phone numbers that your email addresses and addresses available. That's important um, to help you out in the long run. 
So, you know, best practices, like, again, is that management system, communication, and then you get that, that person that you just, you know, I think that they committed fraud and there's not much, we kind of feel like we're in a hard place here. Um, yeah. Communicate those facts, communicate the next steps. Sometimes you just never get them to answer the phone. Yeah. Never get them to answer the phone. We use some different resources as far as reverse lookups and things like that. Um, and those have helped us to track down um, people that have changed phone numbers. And so those are, again, options. Yeah. So there's lots of, there's lots available, right? It's just about, I think, making a priority. So um, before we go, another, I think, really uh, timely question uh, was posed by Mike, which is, what are the, what are the best options for desktop billing and invoicing software, preferably non-cloud-based? What would be, what, what have you seen out there? Invoicing software? Is that what yeah, bill, bill, billing and invoicing software. I'm, I'm sure that you've seen, um, you know, the invoicing and billing software that these, yeah. that some of the top restoration companies use. What, what do they use and what seems to be the, the standard? Yeah, um, you know, I, I want to be as clear as possible that I don't know that I'm the expert of knowing that for you, but I'm going to sure. give you what we use um, and what we see a lot of is Sage and QuickBooks. Um, okay. Yeah, those are the two that we do see a lot of, and that we use that we use quite a bit. Okay, great. Yeah, no, and I've heard I've heard those as well. And both, uh, as far as I know, Sage as well are both available. They have kind of a non-cloud based option they as well. Yes, mm -hmm. so they do have the online, but they also have desktop. Yeah, version. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Now, a great question from from Mike there. So, Brittany, as we as we kind of come to a close here, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so if someone is, is uh, there's, there's probably two, two types of people uh, uh, participating today. One is, um, you know, I've got all these new tools that I want to implement uh, to really take my accounts receivable program to the next level. And mm -hmm. some are probably thinking, I need to call Brittany. <laughs> so yeah. how, how does a person get a hold of you? So the best way to get a hold of me is to just call me directly. Um, okay. So, okay. but you can go to our website and you, and the information that is on there is actually to speak to me directly. Um, okay. That's what I prefer. And so our website, um, I don't know if you guys have it listed, but it's www.arrestoration.com. That's easy to remember. So yeah, yeah check that out. Yeah. And the phone number on there is my direct line. So okay. I will talk to you guys personally and help you out however I can. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Brittany. Brittany Hensley from AR Restoration has been our, our expert guest today, and you've been very generous with your advice. So thanks for taking the time to be with us. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, if you don't have uh, an established accounts receivable process in your company, uh, we'll let know how we've got you covered. We've got free expert built account receivable process templates that you can edit and, and make your own uh, right on your uh, on your desktop device. And uh, I do want to plug our next upcoming webinar, which is next Wednesday, July 15th. And it's entitled How to Price and Deliver and Grow Your Company with COVID-19 Disinfection Work in Restoration. And we've got some experts uh, that are going to be uh, our panelists for, them, for that event next week. So I hope that you'll uh, take a moment and sign up for that as well. Uh, a big thank you to all of our industry partners. Of course, Brittany and her team at AR Restoration, uh, Phil and his team at Business Mentors, Ed Cross at the Restoration Lawyer. There's several times, Brittany, you mentioned, make sure you've got good contracts in place. Make sure you go to talk to Ed Cross's team. And of course, uh, Tim and his team at Business Development Group. So for all of us at Know How, and, and certainly another thank you uh, to you, Brittany, but thanks to all our participants. And uh, I hope everybody uh, was able to take, you know, one or two key things that they can take to improve their AR collection process.